Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, you know, I know we had a little complications, but very excited for this interview. You know, um, uh, do you want to you want to go right in? Oh. Say it again. Oh, do you want to go right in and start? Oh, let me know if you can't hear me or anything. No, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well. Yeah, started. I'm ready. Yeah. All right. So first off, I want to say uh, I think you have a great comedian name. You know, when I when I first heard your name, I thought it was really good. So could you give me the uh, the origin story behind your comedian name? Oh, wow. Well, my comedian name is my uh, my government name. Oh, so, OK. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, great. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> that's why I put my last name on my first name, because I just didn't want to come out like Martini. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> juggling, juggling act or whatever, but <laughs> yeah. oh, Martini Harris. Now, there is a story behind my name. Um, okay. 1972, you know, back then, a woman couldn't fly if she was like four months or something like that over pregnant. But of <laughs> course, technology now allows them to fly even, you know what I'm saying, younger or whatever. But anywho, 1972, my mom was pregnant with me and she was uh, pregnant with me with uh, eight months, actually. Yeah. But I guess I was more so in her back and she had like a little baby bump. So she told them that she was two months. Mm. So that, that followed the procedure. So they let her aboard. But when they got like 35,000, wherever height they go, my mother went into labor and um, she was going into labor and the pilot was informed what was going on. So my mom, uh, so no, yeah, the, the pilot was informed what was going on. And then the pilot got on the PA system and said, we got to make emergency landing because we got another passenger coming aboard. And this calls mm -hmm. for a martini because a martini is a <laughs> celebration drink. And just mm -hmm. like at the end of every movie, when they finna do their last shot, they call it the martini. Mm -hmm. Martini but shot. Anyway, yeah. So anyway, my mom and my grandmother named me Martini. Like all my <laughs> brothers and sisters got common names, but she never drunk. My mother never drunk liquor, nothing. So she's not a, you know, naming her kids after their favorite drinks. You know, <laughs> that'd be yeah. almost like uh, uh, your mom a prostitute, and she's naming all her kids after after dicks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but uh, yeah, but I thought they was lying. I really mm -hmm. did. I said, man, y'all lying, man. Yeah, that story is too good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but no, my grandmother um, showed me the newspaper article, and it was a picture of my mom holding me, and the topic was halfway from heaven. So, wow. Yeah. So that's how I, I got. You were born with headlines coming in. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. So, um, what made you want to explore and then get into comedy? Oh, man, just uh, being a class clown, but not even that, man. I was just the, the, the room clown with my brothers. You know what I'm saying? Uh, comedy was also a mechanism for me or a mm. defense mechanism, I say, like because all my brothers are bigger than me, you know, mm. and even when we were smaller, of course, they were, you know, taller and bigger than me. So I couldn't fight my brothers. So what I'll do is I'll let one I I get if one brother want to beat me up, I'll make my other brother laugh so he can be on my team. And he'll protect <laughs> me. So I use my comedy, you know, but what made me want to get into it, because um, I enjoy doing that. What made me want to get into it? The first comedian I ever saw was George Carlin. And yeah. my mom, my mom used to ask us, you know, what did we want to be when we grew up? So my my brother said he wanted to be a chef because he loved cooking. My mm -hmm. other brother said he wanted to be a cop, but that didn't turn out because when he grew up, he stayed in jail. So I think his dream was dyslexic. But <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but uh, I didn't know what I wanted to be. So mm -hmm. I I waited. And so as time went on or whatever, um, I turned on TV and I seen George Carlin. My mother's boyfriend was watching it on a you know tape. So every time he said, like, every four to five jokes, he'll say, because I'm a shit talker. And he kept saying that. So I told my mom, I said, Mama, I know what I want to be when I grow up. She said, what? I said, a shit talker. <laughs> and she said, boy, what? I said, that man on TV said he's a shit talker. Boy, quit saying that. <laughs> so she said, no, baby, he's a comedian. And I said, oh, I said, well, he kept saying, I'm a shit talker. So, 
So, yeah. So I said, Mom, that's what I wanted to be. So anyway, Saturday morning came up and I was turning the TV and I was looking for this guy because mm. that's you know, like, where's this dude at? So yeah. um, I end up stumbling over this this black guy with this afro and a thick mustache. And it said something about the Richard Pryor show. So I was like, oh, I said, well, may, maybe he'll um, come up on this. So I waited. Now, as I waited, I was in tune looking for George Carlin, but I end up concentrating on Richard Pryor. And I said, this dude is hilarious. So Wait, then, uh, quick question. Yeah. Uh, what, how old were you at the time when you were watching uh, the Richard Pryor and George Carlin? So I was nine years old. Nine years old. Okay, great. <laughs> I was nine years old. So, uh, so anyway, um, he he had you know funny people on there. So I seen Robin Williams. He tripped mm-hmm. me. He tripped me up, and I just loved. I love Robin Williams. Rest his rest his soul. Mm-hmm. I love how he captured every moment. He didn't care where he was. He captured every moment with his characters, and he never ever break character, even if you don't laugh. Robin Williams never broke character. So um, mm. John Witherspoon, all these cats was funny. Then Richard Pryor. And I was just like, wow, man, this dude cool. So he was saying a lot of cool stuff. And I got an old man's soul. So I say right mm. on, get down, solid, you know, bleed that, you know. So he was, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, and he was into it. And then I love how he moved. You know, he had a... <laughs> He had a signature move, man. He got into it, like his fingers and everything, like just, you know, when he talking and and mm-hmm. trying, like he made, I think the cleverness of Richard Pryor's um, material was that he made animals talk. Mm. What do you mean by that? Yeah, he made animals this, this, in his in his in this set. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, in the set, yeah. So you you thought I was thinking like you said, wait, well, didn't Eddie Murphy do a movie on that? <laughs> yeah, like Dr. Damn, so Richard Pryor. <laughs> <laughs> but no, man. So long story short, because I know I can go on and on, man. But uh, no, Richard Pryor, ahead. yeah, yeah, man. Richard Pryor is the one dog that that set that tone to to make me um, aware and identify what it is that I love doing that I had no word for. So it's to make people laugh. And he um, helped show me that it was comedy, you know, comedian. I mean, yeah. dude, I was I was so now I tell you this. I love Richard Pryor. I really do. I love everything he does, man. I love the way he works, but he is not my idol. God is my idol. So but I love Richard Pryor. I really do. He got all the respect for me dead and when he was alive. I respect so, that. Yeah, so man, I I was so into like like uh you know when you go to school, mm-hmm. uh elementary, you gotta fill out the first few days, you gotta fill out the green cards, your address, see if yeah. they know you live, your mom yeah. number, your name number, your and standard all that. stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I filled out the green card and it said, you know, put my mother and address and all that. And then when it said father, I put Richard. Franklin Lennox <laughs> Thomas Pryor. Uh, <laughs> I can't even make this up. I can't, man. I wish I can. I, do I wish I, card. <laughs> they, they still around? Like, um, like our uh, uh, um, what is it? Our tra- um, our transcripts mm. from school. They follow you the rest of your life. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I wish they had that green card. But yeah, man, I knew Richard Pryor whole name. Before I damn near knew mine. <laughs> His whole name, Richard Franklin Lennox Thomas Pryor. So, yeah, I filled it out. And then I got in trouble one day because I love making people laugh. But I did my work. I'm a mm. very smart individual. I always have. I love reading. I love researching. So I got in trouble. And um, they called my mom. So mm. in the midst of me getting in trouble, because we literally stayed down the street. Like my mom walked to my school. Oh, so, that's like. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I didn't know she was in the hallway, and I was cutting up, dude. I was getting down. You understand? Oh, yeah. You know, this girl, I wanted to impress, so I was really into it. So, um, my mom got me, and then the teacher said, uh, "My mom said that the teacher said, um, well." I mean, I know Martini is very intelligent. He really is to be his age. And but he has to learn how to stay in his seat 
you know, because I got ADHD, ING, you mm-hmm. know, I got, you know, so, um, <laughs> so <laughs> she said, well, I was gathering, maybe he was trying to be like his father. And my mom looked like, yeah, she had the same surprise because she ain't seen the nigga. And I ain't seen the nigga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, his father. Where is he at? You know? <laughs> Uh, so, um, so she said, Oh, his father. And she said, yes, Richard Pryor. That's what he has on his card. She said, Richard Pryor. She said, ma'am, Richard Pryor is not his father. (laughs) I got the brakes beat on. (laughs) I know that was a beating you never forget, man. (laughs) I got, I got the brakes. I I got the brakes beat on me so bad. I looked in the mirror crying and I seen Richard Pryor. today. (laughs) I said, you shouldn't lie, motherfucker, right? (laughs) Shit, (laughs) motherfucker. You know. (laughs) Yeah. That's a great story. Like, I, it's it's cool that you were able, like, at a young age, to identify like that thing that you wanted inside of you. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. So you're clearly a natural comedian, very naturally funny. So when you're doing your sets, do you are most of your sets written down, or do you have more improvis improvision uh, when you're doing your sets? Okay. Um. <clears throat> um. I don't write my material. Mm. I don't. And I learned that I learned that years ago because I had a good joke in my head and I put it on paper. But once I had it on paper and I walked away from it, I couldn't remember the joke because I took my head. So now I learned that I write my material like my brain is my pen and my heart is my pad. So when I put it from my brain to my heart, it's still in my body. Wow. Yes. Okay. So, um, can you tell me about one of your best comedy show performances? Oh, wow. One of my best comedy show performances, I'll say, um, oh, 2000. At, um, That's when I was born. At, okay. Okay. See, <laughs> Park West, 2000, Park West in Chicago, Illinois. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I was going through rounds in Detroit to see who was, you know, the top comedian to go represent for Detroit in a comedy competition. Mm. Um, it was nine other, it was nine other cats in the competition, um, which of four of them were from Chicago. So mm. um, I went on stage or whatever when I was called up. Now, here's the thing. My favorite numbers to go up is if I can't get four, which is my top favorite, Mm. If I can't get place four, I'll take two. Two? Okay. Why Why is that? Now, I only say that because in the beginning, that's when the audience is warmed up. Mm. By number four, they there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and it's what I call ride the wave. When I see that audience is, is, is you know, pump, ready, and they laughing, I get my surfboard, man, and I ride that wave. <laughs> I, you know, I take them to another level. And... <laughs> Um, um, but when you get close to the end, they get restless. That's if the comedians are not thunderous, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like I say, if you want to blow up in this game of comedy, you have to be dynamite on stage. So they, if they're not blowing, man, then the audience is restless. They die down. Mm -hmm. So then they tend to forget about what's this, that, and the third, but they'll remember who had them cracking up, and it's number four. Number four? Yeah, wow. so, man, I end up winning first place. Hey! Um, Miller Genuine Draft Comedy Search. That was my one of my best performances, man. Wow, one nice. of my best. I, mean, I did Richard Pryor, and I can see um, Steve Harvey. He was dressed in all white, and I could see him on my peripheral, like, doing all types of body dresses and pointing at me, like, would you listen to this dude? He sounds just like <laughs> Pryor, you know what I'm saying? Man, I, I've been doing Rich Pryor since high school. You know, mm-hmm. I've been, you know, and, um, but it was a lot of things that I did when I was in high school, like to be comical. If I mm-hmm. mess up something, I rewind it, like literally rewind it. Mm-hmm. So I remember that when I started in comedy, when I got into comedy, I used to tell the audience that I messed up a joke. Okay. Yeah. But I used to tell the audience mm-hmm. that I messed up oh, a joke. Okay. So, 
And I learned further more, you know, further longer, you know, because I used to coach myself. And that's what Richard mm. Pryor, Richard Pryor was a natural actor. And that's why I take both mm. of those words and put them together and come up with the word an actor. Richard Pryor was a actor. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> I coached myself in the, in, in, into comedy. Um, uh, it's not about what the audience it's, it's not about what the audience want as far as material wise. Mm-hmm. It's what you want to give them. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's what, what you're presenting you're... to the audience. Yeah, exactly. Because we're hunters and our prey is laughter. You That's know? a good way to put it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. I'm, I'm a hunter, man. My prey is laughter. <laughs> Uh, uh, so on the flip side of that, can you tell me of what maybe not one of your worst performances, but I know you spoke about how you like adju- like look at the audience and tell to see if they're uh, hyped up or not. So is there a time where you've had like a bad performance where maybe the audience wasn't engaged or you've had to like try and be like, ah, oh, they're not really messing with me or not? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> I mean, I felt bad. I felt bad in the beginning of running through those um, paths of failure. Mm. Um, and that show, let me see, that show was, oh, matter of fact, it was a show at a at a little auditorium. Mm. And, and I was so elated in showing them what I had. Mm. But it was the, 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 the formula was not mixing right. Mm. It, it, the, the atmosphere you know what I'm saying it was all off everything nobody laughed and people was getting up and I felt so bad man like it mm. crushed me it wasn't mixing with the audience yeah mm. so it crushed me so I couldn't get into my material I couldn't uh, I couldn't get in my man I was I was I was frozen bro so mm. uh, that was at this place um, at that at that little um oh it was called the um latin quarters in detroit uh, so the latin quarters mm-hmm. that's what it was and man i tell so, you so i oh i was gonna say like so like after a failure after that or after a freeze up after that was it hard to go back and do another stand-up or was it easier for you to just go like okay i messed that up i could just go go back let's try it again let's do this this right. Game. Maybe this yeah, yeah. was a mess. Um, no, 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 it wasn't. It wasn't hard at all. It wasn't hard at all. I was destined to regroup from that show to tell myself, you okay. are to me. You are funny. You are natural. So get out there and find you another show. And the thing is, I'll go somewhere. It goes go like to several spots and wait for that next week. If this is a weekly place, which it was. And I went back. Mm. I back and I challenged that stage, you know, you where I bombed and people walked out and um, I got great laughs. I didn't get a standing ovation then, mm. but I did, you know what I'm saying? Like down the road, but then, but I had them laughing. So I come on stage. Yeah. Adversity. If I do that. Yeah. Yeah. All day, all day. Okay, so um, before this interview, you know, I I went through your Instagram and uh, watched a few of your sets and you talked about it. So I could tell you're influenced by Richard Pryor. So I also saw you have uh, you have a Richard Pryor inspired project coming out. Um, You already spoke to his influence about you as a comedian. um, But can you talk about the project and what it's about and what you're uh, doing with it? Um, Well, the thing I can talk about. Um, the thing I can talk about is December 1st and 2nd, I'll be at the, in Dallas, Texas, I'll be at mm-hmm. the Black, at the Black Academy Arts and Letters. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be the Clarence Muse, the Clarence Muse Theater. So I'm doing that mm-hmm. on December 1st, which is Richard Pryor's birthday. And it's, okay. uh, yeah, I was selected to be, um, to do an, uh, a Richard Pryor tribute. Wow. So, Okay. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, man, and I can't wait for. It. I mean, I, I can't wait. 
I think wait. you're ready for it. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. Yeah, so it's it's going. I do two shows. It's on one on the first, and I'm doing another tribute on the second. Uh, okay. December. Yeah. Okay. Good. Here. Yeah. So, um, but there are some stipulations with the project that I can't conversate about because of uh, WGA being on strike as well, and it's it's, it's bad right now. Um, the strikes. So the strikes affecting, uh, what is it affecting how the um project's being made or just? Yeah, yeah, it's it's affecting every everything is on strike. The writer writer guy got um wow. writer guy of America. Yeah, yeah, man, it's mm. affecting wow. actors are really going nuts right now. <laughs> well, some mm-hmm. of them, but they you know ain't got to work. They got to pay bills. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully they get that done because you know, writers need to be paid. You know. Oh yeah. Okay. But this this is but this is a great moment where is something that I can inhale. I can inhale mm-hmm. this. It's a great moment. Um, um, in 1990, it was the early 90s. I'll say that the early 90s. The first mm-hmm. person that was said to do the Richard Pryor biopic was Damon Wayans. And, you know, I get, I hear people at some time, man, Damon Williams is never up for that. I was like, bro, he was the first one said to do it. And this was, um, this was during, this was during the original Arsenio Hall show time. It was um, that era. So um, Damon Williams was, um, was on the Arsenio Hall show and I watched it faithfully. So um, Damon was talking about how, how he went to go visit Richard Pryor and he was talking to him, you know, Richard Pryor was in and out, you know what I'm saying? Like he, he's cool with you one time. Then the next time it's like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type shit, you know what I'm saying? So, um, he was talking to Rich, telling him how much he, he loved him and admire him, this and that. And, and Rich, you know how you, you tell somebody that. And then you're like, man, get the fuck out of here. And then you're like, no, no, serious. You know, but when he said that, uh, um, it, it was told to him that he really wanted him to leave. And he talked about how when he got home, when he got home, that on his answering service, they pulled him from the movie. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, and man, I tell you, I'm going to tell you why I was heartbroken. Because I, um, it, there was a, um, there was a Richard Pryor competition during that time in Atlanta, Georgia. Never forget it. At the old, at the original Uptown Comedy Corner on Peace Street. And um, at the time, my god sister, mm-hmm. she stayed in Atlanta. She called me up and said, baby, they doing a Richard Pryor competition. You need to get out here. And I said, when? She said, today. I was like, I said, today? I'm like, no, oh, I can't, I mean, I, I can't do this, that, and the third. So, she was like, baby, go to the airport. I got your ticket, blah, blah, blah. So, dude, I left immediately. Didn't pack shit. Left immediately. Man, you know, of course, got my shit and I got dressed and all that other stuff. But I didn't need nothing. <laughs> so I got out there. She bought me an outfit. I went mm-hmm. to it. I won first place. And it was something to play alongside of Damon Wayans. Um, and, and during the, the biopic. So, um. Mm-hmm. Um, at that time, at that time, Damon, Damon, Damon wasn't there. I never, I didn't meet him, but I won a competition. Mm-hmm. And then the, at that time, they, they gave me 3000 and I also signed a contract with Paramount. That's what I was looking for. Paramount and TriStar. TriStar Pictures. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, man. And dude, I've been chasing that movie since the nineties. Never let it go. Never, man. Even when they said, "Yeah, credit they, to you for the commitment." Yeah, man. Even when they said, "This is the person they award," dude. I know, like from beginning to end, who all had the movie, and who, dude, from beginning to end, bro. That's how much I followed it, you know, and mm-hmm. just kept following it. So, um, man, I believe in myself that much. You know, I live off words of wisdom. 
that I get from my heavenly my heavenly father. I mm-hmm. can live off work of wisdom. And you know, my heavenly father told me certain things, man, mm-hmm. where he said, if if anything that you hold in that I didn't ordain, it'll slip through your fingers like sand. Dude, I can't even put those mm-hmm. words together. You know what I'm saying? I can't even put them together. And he also told mm-hmm. me, if you want to be with the best, then be the best. That way the best will want to be with you. You know, and I tell you this, uh, uh, great Kool-Aid, uh, great comedian. I mean, great. Okay. great yeah, I say great Kool-Aid. <laughs> but, yeah, man. <laughs> his name is actually Kool-Aid, but he was, it was on my oh, head. Okay. And I said the name, but but great comedian from Detroit he passed away um, December 9th, um, 2018. His name was Tyrone Wright, my best friend in the whole wide world. Um, we started comedy together. And we also ended it comedy together. He died of a uh, rare, a rare um, bone cancer. So, uh, yeah. So, but um, it was a part where his voice went out, and he couldn't speak, but he can hear, of course. So he wrote something on some paper, folded it up, and gave it to him. Then he wrote something else, and he gave me that one to read. So I read it, and he said, "Please promise me, don't open up the folded paper." until you get home and i was and i promised him so i did keep that promise even in the car and i waited till i got home and when i got home i unfolded the paper and it said the reason why they haven't did the richard Pryor biopic yet is because they haven't seen you and wow. uh yeah and then like five days later he passed away so and i you know kool-aid wow. represented detroit to the fullest he at the end of his his um death, um shout out to Lil Duval. Lil Duval took him on tour. So yeah, wow. so he yeah, he allowed him to share his to to really feel his dream before he left this earth. So Lil Duval let him go on tour with him and he did big stages, arenas, everything. So but I keep him on stage because I got his ashes right here. And every time I hit the stage. That's beautiful. Yeah, every time I hit the stage, this is Kool-Aid. This is and this is my son. Because two months later, my son passed away. You know. So oh. people really thought I was gonna lose it. They thought I was gonna lose it. They thought I was just gonna give up on everything because he lost his best friend, like his brother. And then two months later, he loses his son. You know. But my thing is, man, that's why I stay prayed up. And I don't say prayed up far as I pray before I go to bed or I pray why, you know what I'm saying? That's or in the morning. Yeah, I do. I stay prayed up. I leave the prayer in me. I recite the prayer in my bones, in my blood, in my muscles, my tissues, my vessels, you know, and I keep it with me, man. Mm-hmm. So I know that <clears throat> I know that. um I'm not going to allow mental illness to take over. We all got mental illness, just like every man got eyes, just like a woman. But man ain't got titties unless you ate a whole bunch of snacks and shit. But um, <laughs> but uh, but the thing is, man, uh, uh, man, I just lost my motherfucking train of thought. <laughs> Damn, that was bold as hell. Yeah, you no, nah, keep it going. You <laughs> take a second to catch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get it. But anyway, I was talking about the woman and the man with the same eyes or whatever. Mm. Uh, yeah, I did. I lost shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I got that bubble. I uh, swear, boy, that was like a hundred dollars, and I dropped that shit. And like, oh, niggas following me. That shit gone. Uh, am I back? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I just want to say, yeah, that was some very like powerful stuff that you were able to um just keep going, and uh, that every every even uh to take your best friend on stage with you every um every oh, set yeah. that you do and your son. That's very really beautiful well. and like inspiring. Yeah, I have to. Um, man. I keep him on stage. Okay. Um. What's um. 
Yeah, you know, I wrote questions down here, but you're so good. You're such a like, a, this is such a genuine experience. I'm kind of like trying to pick and choose. Oh, okay. I ask you that. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. No, 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 no. You're all right. This is this is great. Um, okay, so I was saying, uh, is there a, a set that you and Kool-Aid have, have done that you uh, remember uh, uh, fondly? No, no, I was asking, are you are you referring to my set? Like remembering my set with me and Kool-Aid? Um, yeah, yeah, like a set that you guys did together. Oh, a set that, that, that you we uh, remember fondly. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you saying like on stage together? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. we, were, we were never on stage together, but just like oh, okay, individually. Mm, yeah. Okay, like he go first, I go second, type thing. But we were uh, never, uh, um, yeah, we were never like a duo comedy skit. Mm. Yeah, I got you. I got yeah, you. yeah. But um, okay, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. We was me and Kool Aid was roommates for like sixteen years flat. Like wow. for yeah, we were roommates for sixteen oh. years. He roommated with a lot of a lot of comedians before, but mm -hmm. um, he roommate with Spanky Hayes from Wildin' Out, uh, Tony Roberts. Mm. Yeah. Wow, really? Hey, Tony Roberts. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Blunt. You know, uh, um, shout out to Joe Blunt for writing this movie, uh, Once Upon a Time in Detroit. Uh, great, great comedian, man. Great writer. You know what I'm saying? And he had Kool-Aid, Tyler Perry. I mean, not Tyler Perry, but um, uh, uh, man, I said Tyler Perry. I meant Rodney Perry. There we go. My dog. Rodney Perry, uh, myself was in it. Um, Thomas Ward was the uh, vi videographer. You know, he did all the, the he directed a lot. He's out of Vegas and LA. But Thomas Ward, man, great dude, man. You know, but um yeah. Yeah. But uh Kool-Aid Kool-Aid man was hilarious. That brother was hilarious, man. Like for real. You know. You don't earn the nickname Kool-Aid without being the funniest dude, like <laughs> Right. Man, he was quick yeah. on his He was quick. He was quick, man. That quick wit. You know. So, but when me and him, when me and him was around each other, man, especially when we go out of town, like me and Kool-Aid in 95, 1995, me and Kool-Aid went on tour with Eddie, Eddie Griffin. Now, there's a story behind mm. that. I can release that now. Uh, I used to always think like Eddie Murphy from Beverly Hills Cop. So when I want to when I want to get into somewhere or get something that I want, um, <clears throat> um, not stuff that you have to buy with money because I wouldn't steal it. But um, I'll read I'll recite that song. The thing on dun 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 dun. And I think so. Eddie Griffin was coming to the Masonic Temple in Detroit, Michigan, ninety five. Um, mm. Kool Aid was teasing me because he had bought tickets. He's like, "Yeah, nigga, I got the tickets, Eddie Griffin." And I was like, "Yeah, okay." I didn't have a car, but I did walk all the way downtown. But I, you know, I was like, the walk probably was like, like three miles at no, I say about six miles at the most, um, to walk from where I was in downtown. So I walked downtown to the Masonic Temple, and. I noticed in the back door, they had like a little line or whatever. So back then, the lanyards, they're better now. But back then, they had really like yarn string with the paper or whatever. So I looked at it, and I was doing it. Mm -hmm. dun, 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 doing that, and I had my Eddie Murphy on. So I'm like, wow. So I'm looking around, and I'm walking outside, and I happen to find a piece of yarn. Um, the 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 yarn that they use and dude mm -hmm. that's like gold right there so i found some paper and remember yeah. the car. remember the car because you know when you got those on they'll happen to flip backwards and all you see is white so um so nobody actually yeah. knows. i found the paper found the paper and i cut it out or whatever and um, um put the yarn through it put it over my neck so then i start 
I, I started talking fast. He said, the faster you talk and more questions you ask, they're not going to worry about who are you or try to see your, your badge. Because they see the yarn mm -hmm. and they see the square thing like, okay, well, he belong here. I said, all right, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. Don't put nobody in yet. Eddie Griffin needs to get picked up. Where, where's the um? Where's the promoter at? They said, what's his name? Where is he at? He said, you mean Doc? I said, yeah, where's Doc at? Oh, I think he's backstage. And I was like, hey, you just hold him right there. So, dude, I found Doc, and I had rolled up like a diploma was my resume. So I was like, and that's when my humbleness kicked in. And I said, hey, Doc, uh, how you doing? He was like, what's up, man? I said, yeah, man, I'm a, um, I'm a Detroit comedian, man. And I, man, I love Eddie Griffin, dog. And I, I was wondering if I can open up for him. And I said, I got my resume and I handed it to him. And he was like, he said, let me tell you something, young man. Um, when you present somebody with something, you don't present it with it um, folded up or rolled up. He said, you give it to him in flat, you know, that's professional. And I was like, dang. So I was like, all right. He said, but no, man, you can't open up for him, this and that. So I was like, all right, man, dang. I said, but thanks a lot, man. So I walked out. He said, you want to enjoy the show? And I said, yeah, 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 I'll be out there. So um, I walked back out. And around that time, it was houses. Dude, I can't even make this up. I can't even make, dude, I knocked on the first door. This is show you those times that were nowhere near today's time. An old white lady, dude, came to the door. And I explained to her what I was going through. But she wasn't scared, frightened, or nothing. It's, it was almost like I was destined to be there. Like, if I knocked on the door to the right or to the left, you know, I had to do the one in the middle. So I went and she let me in, heard my story. And she had the iron board that drops out the, the wall, you know, in the kitchen. Dropped in and she said, this is how you do it. And she put her hand in some water and sprinkled it on my resume and then ran the iron over it. <clears throat> and it was flat. It was good. So then she went and gave me a folder. Dude, put it in the folder. And she said, good luck. I do. I do. I promise you that was my angel. And that lets me know, man, that, that further lets me know that when God is talking to you in your career, you have to listen. Because had I not listened, brother, I would have went to the house on the right or the one to the left. But I listened and went to the one I was directed to go to. So I went back and I had to put my Eddie Murphy back on because I got to get back into the theater again. All right, uh, look, look, man, um, uh, Eddie Griffin about to get picked up. And um, where those people at? He said, oh, no, man, they all went into the back. And I'm like, all right, well, you can let people in now. So I went back up and I found Doc. And I said, hey, Doc. And he was like, he said, hey, man, what's going on? I said, yeah, man, it's going to be my resume. I gave him a folder and he opened it and was like, come on, man, you ain't did that. He said, you stay around here? I said, no, I don't. I said, you know, I, somebody let me in the house and Look me up, so I'm here, and I'm like, man, I really want to open it for Eddie Griffin, but I know you said no, but I wanted to give you my resume just in case, you know, you may want to book. You need a comedian, and he was like, you know what, man, I like you. He said you didn't take no for an answer. Had the Eddie Murphy on. He let me open up for Eddie Griffin. Now watch this. Remember Kool Aid? He teased me at the house over. He got tickets, but I walked out on stage. <laughs> so, I was on stage. This is a true story, bro. As I walked down on stage and was doing my thing, he told me, You got three minutes. So I'm I'm respectful of the time as a comedian, just like today. I'm very respectful. Mm -hmm. So um I'm looking at my I'm looking at my watch I had on, and I'm like, all right, and I'm doing it, and they laugh, and I'm like, all right, my name is Martini Harris, thank God. So I'm walking towards the um, the cut off the stage and I seen Doc and I thought he was mad. And I said, hey, man, I was handing him mic. And I said, hey, man, I apologize if I went over. He said, no, man, I was telling you to keep going, man. You funny. And I was like, I said, oh, thanks, bro. But I didn't know Kool-Aid was on his way back to trying to get to the stage. <laughs> so he said, yeah, man, Eddie ain't here yet. He said, can you do some more time? I said, yeah. And I said, well, look, it's another comedian out here. I said, he's funny as hell, just like me. So um, uh, the radio personality guy from 98 FM in Detroit was Billy T and Motown Mike. Motown mm -hmm. Mike hold Billy T was like, oh man, I can't let you in. And he was like, come on, Billy. And then he seen Kool-Aid, seen me and said, Martini, man, come on. 
I was like, no, no, no. I said, move, Billy. I said, come on, dog. You about to go on stage. He was like, what? I said, yeah, you need somebody else. He asked me if I'd do some more time. I told him that you was coming. So, dog, Kool-Aid went out there, towed that mug up. So after that, um, they did yeah. they ended up doing the show, dog. They ended up doing the show. Eddie Griffin came out, did his thing. And me and Kool-Aid um, went to go check the show out. Then we came back um, to the backstage. And Doc said, hey, man, Eddie Griffin, Eddie Griffin want to see you. And he was like, oh, for real? So we went back there and we was kicking it with him, you know. And then he was like, yeah, man, how would you fellas like to go on tour? And say, hey, yeah, man, we he said, well, look, we had the Anthenium Theater. I mean, Anthenium um, Suites Hotel. That's downtown Detroit. Uh, and he said, the bus is picking us up at 5 o'clock in the morning. He said, now, you be there at 4. Or, you know, at 4. Not 4.30, but 4. And you can get on the bus. And they got beds on the bus. So it was like that. Dude, that was after the show. The show ended at 11. Me and Kool-Aid went home, <laughs> packed our bags. We was back downtown yeah. on the side of the Anthenium Theater, sitting on the wall, dog, with our luggage, dude, at one something in the morning. Wow. And we waited, and we was like, dang, man. And we just cracking jokes and just looking at girls and just talking about niggas, you know what I'm saying? Like, look at that nigga's shoes. <laughs> like, man, um, <laughs> I said, look at that, man. I said, all these people walking right past us, they don't even know that we about to go. They don't even know. Griffin. They don't yeah. even know. You know, that's how angels are, dog. You don't even know, bro. You don't even know who you walking wow. past. Yeah, you don't even know. So the bus came, man. We went on tour, and we took turns going first and second, you know what I'm saying, on every state, every city. Dude, it was amazing, bro. Man, it was amazing. Man, I'm on my last out-of-town, just like big out-of-town, great show with Kool-Aid before he passed, we was in on um, Martha's Vineyard. And it's a black owned island, you know, uh, a black doctor, um, which The Rock has a house out there now. And Bill Murray, we met Bill Murray. He has a house out there. On, um, wow. It's out of Boston. You have to go to Boston, Massachusetts and take a ferry, a 45 minute ride, and it takes you to the island called Martha's Vineyard. You got to bring all your food because oh. their food is high. That's where Martha's Vineyard is? Huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Martha's Vineyard is also um um where they did Jaws and the Inkwell. That's where I was. Really? The Inkwell, Jada Pinkett, and the young um, Lorenz Tate. Yeah, Inkwell and Jaws. That was the water that they did the movie Jaws at Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. Wow, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, so um, that's uh, uh, his name is Steve Caper. He's a great mm. producer. He's not a promoter, none of that. He's a producer, you know. So Steve Caper, shout out to him. And um, his host was from Chicago, Damon Williams, one of my good friends. We go mm. 20, 20 plus years back, man. Great guy, man. He opened up for, you know, the Kings of Comedy, went on tour with them. He was their open. Yeah. So Damon Williams, yeah. funny, man, he he did all the host. He still do that. They do it um, in the fall. Um, every August, the whole month of August, is like um, broken in quarters. Like this, this week is um, this week is like a load of comedians, and then the next weekend of that August month is another load than the last weekend of it. And that's how they do it every year, dog. And every year. Wow. Yeah. So. Yeah, man, me and Kool-Aid was there, dog. And um, it was actually me, Kool-Aid, and Howie Bell. Howie Bell from Detroit, of course, y'all know. But um, mm -hmm. me and Howie Bell went to high school together, too. So we were silly as hell. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, we went to Martin Luther King. Yeah, you all connected. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was like the – and we were – we're fooling, dog. We got footage, and man, we were fooling on that island. Yeah, so I bet, <laughs> man, it's actually cool, man. Uh, okay, yeah, that's yeah, that sounds amazing. You've been living lives, man. You've been going everywhere. Oh, yeah. um, so, um, 
Okay, a little pivot question, but how does your family feel about you being a comedian? Um, they love it. They love it. Do you ever like revert to uh, dad jokes, like uh, when you're around like your family, or do you just keep it regular comedy, like when you're cracking jokes? No, I'm no, I it, I, I allow the atmosphere to take me, so I want to ad lib, so I'm natural, and my audience know it. Cause they'll say, "Dude, you was doing stuff straight off, like on the spot, like that's." Oh no, they- I, I met I met with your family. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, like my family, okay. they, okay. you know what I'm saying. I know, uh, I know my family love okay. me, you know. And the thing is, I know I, I got a lot more. I got a lot more work to do or whatever because they don't break their neck yeah. to come see me. You know what I'm saying? Because they see me all the yeah. time. You know what I'm saying? But but they love what I do. You know. Mm-hmm. So when that when that big break happens, that money coming out mm-hmm. every show. Oh, now it's this that. But I love them. <laughs> I love them. I understand. You know, I understand they got their life. So yeah, let them let them do that. It can't come to every show, but I gotta be at every show. You know. So. Mm-hmm. That's good. So, um, how do you unwind from comedy? Or, or, not even from comedy, but how, how do you unwind, like, as a person from, like, your job or doing all of this? Um, how do I unwind? <clears throat> mm-hmm. I, I unwind with comedy. Mm-hmm. I live comedy. Yeah. To me, comedy is real life, where real life is just comedy. You know, but um, I use comedy to unwind, man. Comedy is my shrink. Comedy is what I can talk to and it understands me. It's just like when I go on stage, I talk to my alter ego. Just... Yeah, my alter ego, where you freezing up. No, nah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, oh, okay. Um, my alter ego, I talk to my alter ego when I'm on stage. It's almost like a stick shift. You know, sometimes when I'm in one, I need to be in two. Sometimes when I'm in four, I need to be in five. Other times I just need to be in neutral. But um, mm-hmm. uh, my alter ego tell me like, look, man, do this joke. All right, all right. they laughed at that. Now go on over here, do this joke. All right, get over here. And and all right, they didn't really laugh at that joke, but don't tell them. But do what you used to do <laughs> in high school. Do the rewind. So the rewind that I came up with, and when they don't really laugh at a certain joke, I end up tricking my audience and making them laugh anyway with doing a rewind. And I tell them, I say, wait a minute, I take my comedy serious. So whatever you don't laugh at, I take back. So I remember every (laughs) footing that I did in the joke, and I rewind it and just... And then I'll start the joke again and they crack the fuck up. Yo, that's crazy. <laughs> so I mean to me, man, comedy is 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 no different from um magic, you know. So we all know that this man didn't bring a bird out of his hand or even you know pull a flower and turn it into fire. But it was how he tricked our minds, how he entertained our minds, I'd say. And um, that's comedy, man. That's comedy. You have to learn how to um, trick your audience mind with what you're talking about and how you're delivering it and what material that you're speaking of. You know, you got to have animation in it. You know, I'm an animated comedian. You know, it's the animation got a lot of ADHD. I can't stand in one spot. I can't. I'm walking around and doing this, that, and the third. You would think a minds was on stage. Like, can't stand there. Can't stand there. Can't stand there. <laughs> but, uh, but man, is is comedy is my is my love, is my joy. And I thank God for my craft, my blessing. I really do gift man i really do so yeah man yeah i 
I, I often find like whenever I like hear other people talk about something they're very passionate about and like what how they love it the most, like they never stop it. It's always like a consistent thing. Like they keep doing it. And like you, how you said, like you unwind with comedy, you live and breathe it. That's like that shows like your passion for it and like how how like dedicated you are to this. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh a few more. Uh who is the person that makes you laugh the most? Who is the person that makes me laugh the most? It can't be yourself or your alter ego. That's cheating. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. So, <laughs> but no, the person that um, made me laugh the most is uh, Kevin Hart. Really? Yes. <laughs> Kevin. Uh, uh, uh. And it, I only say that, I only say that because Kevin is only being his natural self. It's people that's looking for other things that he's supposed to, uh, he's supposed to do, I guess, you know, and where some people, oh, Kevin Hart's not funny to me, you know, and it's like, oh, okay. Like, you know, because you're looking at it wrong. You're looking at, like, what he's saying. You have to look at how he's saying it, that what he, <laughs> what he's, um, mm -hmm. What he's describing is something that he really went through. He wants you to feel his pain. Even though he did the show, Feel yeah. My Pain, every show is Feel My Pain. He still wants you to feel his pain. Yeah, laugh at his pain. Yeah, like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, laugh at my pain. Yeah, he still wants you to laugh at his pain. You know, that's why he did that first one. I st Even though this, mm -hmm. this show has a different name, but still, laugh at my pain. Put fire on that bitch. No. <laughs> you know... But uh, yeah, man, Kevin Hart makes me laugh. Uh, Mike Epps makes me laugh. Mike Epps is silly. That, that nigga, he's silly as hell. You know, Mike don't give a. I, I like. I like that answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember like being like uh, in like middle school watching like a laugh at my pain. Like the two, uh, I forgot what the other Kevin Hart special was called, but those two, everybody would come to school and just start quoting, quote, like, quoting Kevin Hart the whole time. Like me and my all friends, right, like, all right, and no, he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't ready. Yeah, see, that stuff like that, that stuff like that, man, it's stuff like that that gets you Oscars and Emmys. You know what I'm saying? I know how to get an Oscar. I know how mm -hmm. to get it. You know, you got to go above and beyond just acting the character and becoming the character. You know what I'm saying? You got to show blood, sweat, and tears on that character. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, Joe Clark. I still say, like uh, Morgan Freeman. I still mm -hmm. say he should have he, he got some type. I don't, well, I have to Google it later. I don't know if he won an award for that movie, but he should have got one if he did. You know, you ever seen that movie Lean On Me? You ever seen Lean On Me? Or you froze again? Um, well, Morgan Pri I don't think so, no. Yeah, yeah, but... Um, uh, Lean on no, no, I haven't seen Lean On Me. Yeah, he played a principal. He played a principal. Uh, his name was Joe Clark. Uh, what mm. city was that in? State. Uh, but anyway, it was called Lean On Me. And Morgan Freeman played the mess out of that man. He like, I only got, I only got, I only got Morgan Freeman's voice as Joe Clark because, too, if you look at the movie, it has a, uh, it has a delay in the sound. So when he's saying something, the mouth moving, so it damn near looked Chinese. <laughs> but that's how the the editor did it. But um, like he'll say, "Come on, take a look." They said one bad apple spoils a bunch, and God have us, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> doing his voice, man, just you know. Uh, but I know how to get deep into into those those characters, those actors, like Richard Pryor, man. I just I feel like it's a string connected from I like from him and connected to me, like pinky mm. to pinky nail to nail, knuckle to knuckle and so forth, all over and he's puppeting me and showing me how to move like his mannerism mm. so, 
Yeah, man. So it's the same thing with um Keith David. You know who he is? Actor Keith David. Keith David, yeah. Yeah, Keith, Keith David. Now, um, I got his voice because he's a sarcastic actor in whatever he does, but he's natural. See, and it, 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 it goes, everybody voice that I got are natural. You know, I can't get it if you're not natural, but he's natural. You know, Keith David is like, you know, when I was just a boy, I understood what I had to do. That's perfect. <laughs> Yo. He, he, was, he was always sarcastic. Like, I can see him being sarcastic, like, in Detroit. Like, uh, like if somebody got, like, if somebody got, uh, somebody almost got hit by a car, you know, mm-hmm. like, and he just show up, you know what I'm saying? Like, why be damned? You didn't see that car. You know, you almost lost your goddamn life. Yeah, you know what you are. No, yeah, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, idiot. You know. <laughs> yeah, man. I get lost yeah. in the match. Yeah. No, man, you're good. That was that was yeah, that was a very good Keith David. <laughs> yeah, I can do an impression on my father. <laughs> Your father? I was, yeah, yeah, I was about to say, you said you were... <laughs> invisible. Yo, you crazy, man. <laughs> they, said, uh, they said, you ever seen an invisible man? I said, oh, my daddy? <laughs> <laughs> when I, I was going to say, when I was in high school, we used to do the dozens or the roast or capping or going ham, you know, talking mm-hmm. about. We used to always do yeah. that in the locker room. So... I used to come up with my own caps. You know what I'm saying? I used to come up with my own. Like uh I told I told somebody, I said, um, like we would do mama jokes. You know, like the old one when they say your mama, your mama so fat. Your mama so fat, uh she stand she stand next to the sun and and uh and the city will go dark. <laughs> so I used to come up with my own. I say, uh I said, your mama's so fat, she's sweating when she swim. I don't know. But you froze again. I froze. Oh, I heard the joke. It, it came in late, but... Yeah. See? Yeah. See, timing is everything. Mm-hmm. Timing is everything. And I have a formula. I have a formula for comedy um, mm-hmm. that I wrote years ago. And it's... um, I used to... I call it... Uh, um, um, energy... Creativity, time. Yeah, creativity, energy, and time. I call it KET, C E T. Creativity, energy, and timing. If you put, you can talk about a shoestring tip, but if you put creativity to it, energy, and timing, you can make it funny. That's just like, that's just like when people don't know you as a comedian or artist, you have to carry comedy. Mm. But once you start mm. developing and get out there like Chris Tucker did in all his movies and uh, Kevin Hart did in all his movies, Mike Epps in his movies, comedy starts to carry you. So whatever you say, they'll just laugh at it. The shit can mm. be funny and they'll just laugh at it because comedy is carrying you now. But um, my formula I came up with with the the cat, the creativity, energy, and timing. I learned from the Three Stooges. I watched the Three okay. Stooges today, to this day. Three Stooges are great comedy teachers. It's, it's hilarious. It's, yeah, it's very yeah, funny. They're great comedy teachers, and I tell you this: the Three Stooges formula was the three D's. That's the dork, the dart, and the deer. Mo was the dark, even though he was stupid, because he was always straightforward and he bullied the other two. Larry was the deer because mm-hmm. he was philosophical. He was sentimental. Hey, leave him alone. Or hey, why don't we do this? He wanted to do something the right way, but he was dumb and still messed it up. Curly was the mm-hmm. door because he was the one that would crack the walnut, throw the nuts away, and eat the shell. You know, so 
that's what it is with comedy, man. You got to have the three D's, the dork, the dart, and the deer. And that's that's with a joke. You set a joke up, you're using a dart formation because you're setting the joke up to um, to deliver it to your, your audience of understanding. You're, piling, you know, you're driving them to understand what you're talking about. Then you put the deer and like, if you talk about like, yeah, this dude jumped off the, off the porch and he broke his leg and da 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 this and that. But when you do the deer, you're talking about the philosophical part of it, what you would have done differently to Mm -hmm. not your leg. Then Mm -hmm. the punchline is the dork. That's when the people think they with you and they think you're going right. That's when you hit them left real fast. And that is to create the the creative part of comedy. Set it up. Wow. Dork. I mean, dark. Um, um, give your point of view the deer, and then take them to another world. The dork. And that's your punchline. And they all go together. Yeah, when the book coming, man? Huh? And when oh. the book coming? Oh, the book coming soon, man. I got a uh, <laughs> no, no. Seriously, I got a book. Uh, I got a book that I got coming out, and I titled it um, "Where's My Comedian." And I know that a lot of people look at me like, "Oh, he does comedy," and they think I'm talking about comedy. But <clears throat> what got me into comedy was the trauma that I went through in my life, and I'm writing everything. I'm not missing a T to cross or an I to dot. Um, mm-hmm. but uh, it talks about my life and what I've been through, and this is why I chose comedy because comedy makes me happy. It makes me feel better than what I did going through what I went through. Um, my the a quick synopsis of it. Um, my uh, my alter ego when I was on stage, like I told you before, that my alter ego tells me what jokes to do, this and that. So one day I was on mm. stage and my alter ego said, man, look at all them people laughing. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, dog, that's that's crazy because they don't even see the pain behind my smile. You know what I'm saying? They don't see it. They don't see that it's a painted smile on my face, but behind that pain, dude, there's a frown. So my thing is, I said, wow, man, I want what I'm giving them. I want a comedian, too, to make me feel good because they're not worried about their problems, situations or whatever. They just laughing and feeling good. All that shit is out the door until they leave. Um, And that's when I said, man, I want a comedian, too. Where's my comedian? So that's my book. Where's my comedian? Wow. Yeah. And, well, I def I'll definitely gonna want to read that for sure. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 man. Okay, you said you wrote your first uh, what? My first movie. Um, during the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, it's called A Month From Now. It's already written, so I'm just waiting until I get to a greater platform, and that way I can. Uh, it'll be easier for me to shop it. But you know, yeah, it's called a month from now. It's uh, it's drama, it's suspense, and there's love. Yeah, so suspense I try to. Love? Yeah, it's drama, suspense, and there's love, and I try to write away from all other movies, like you know, um, and I know you're young, you probably don't remember some of these movies, but. Um, like, uh, well, not this one. You remember Money, um, All About the Benjamins? Yeah. Okay, Mike Epps, Ice Cube. Now, mm-hmm. they were looking, the main thing was they were looking for a lottery ticket that he mm-hmm. won that gangsters end up having because, you know, he dropped his wallet. Now, mm-hmm. they got that part from, um, they got that part from Sidney Poitier and Bill Cosby. It was called... Hey, hey. It was called Let's um, Which Way Is Up. I mean, not Which Way Is Up. I'm sorry, Uptown Saturday Night. And um, when he went to a club called Madame Zenobia, they got robbed because he hit the lottery and he got robbed. Mm-hmm. 
but he didn't know he bought a he bought a lottery ticket and they was at the club and some dudes came in there and they robbed and told everybody to strip and took all their wallets and jewelry. So he got his money. So they had to leave. So Bill Cosby and Sidney Poitier went on this big Yahoo ride to go find this damn wallet and all types of stuff, man. But yeah, they got that part from out of that. I mean, not to say it wasn't good, and it, it, it's good. You know, they, uh, yeah, the same scenario, but a different point of view, which was good. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, man, but in my movie, I tried to write away from a lot of stuff. I wanted to, um, I wrote out of uh, nostalgia, for one. Um, I wrote uh, unique, uh, different, unique, but... Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to write to show what people can relate to. Everybody been um, left behind, you know what I'm saying? Treated bad, you know, or being taken care of. Um, shootouts to protect someone you love. So all that stuff is wrapped up in there and it's called a month from now. Because you see what's going on, but a month from now, you got to see what happens. So that's uh, my yeah, I, I'm excited for it. Uh, I went to school for film and media, and I want to be a script writer, a screenwriter too. And that sounds amazing. That sounds like, you know, oh, yeah. like a really good, really good movie. Yeah, yeah, right on. <laughs> yeah, but I got something else coming up too. Um, actually, um, oh, um, I got Apollo. Yeah, I do. Apollo, Apollo Theater. Yes. September. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get to rub the law. So you already know I'm about to throw that Richard Pryor out there. And I love New York. <laughs> Shout out to the New York comedians, man. Talent, uh, Capone, uh, uh, Smokey, Suarez, uh, A.G. White, Marlon Randolph. Man, all them great guys, man. Okay, but you said that was September uh, September 5th or 25th? No, 27th. So uh, September 27th. All right, the Apollo. Yeah. Great. Yo, that's amazing. Yeah, man. So I can't wait for that, man. Because I, I, and it's, it's, and the thing is, I want to channel Richard Pryor so much because I know he touched that stage before. So I'm about to place my foot on the same stage that he placed his on. You know. Um. So that's gonna be beautiful, man, to do the Apollo Theater, man, and just give it to him. Just, yeah, man. Say, man, get down, right? Back, <laughs> <laughs> see, huh? You know, I love Richard Pryor, yeah. man. That brother, like, even in interviews, you know, if you notice, Richard Pryor never ever answer a question, a direct question from an interviewer. Never. Yeah, yeah he. Richard allowed you to know what he wanted you to know, you know, because like the it was it's an interview that's surfacing that's been out there for years when he did stir crazy with Gene Rob and uh, Rich. He was he, clever that way, man. He was fooling on that joint. I mean, my man couldn't he wouldn't answer. Richard wouldn't answer nothing that dude asked. <laughs> you know, he would just go off into another world. Just so, Richard, um, uh, how do you feel about you know the movie with Gene Wilder? Like, say, man, you don't know, like you don't know, say, baby, you ever went to the store and you seen like one of your buddies outside, right? You know, say, baby, go and get me something in there, you know, because he can't go in, right? <laughs> you know, and he just go off into something else. He don't care, man. He just went off into a whole nother entity, dog. Just like, man, that dude was great, man. He was brilliant. Okay, um. Well, you you kind of already uh, answered some of my questions that uh, I was asking, like, well, what else you had in store for you said the Apollo? Um, you know, do you have anything else that you um, that you uh, have in store? Um, the Black Arts, uh, the Black Arts Academy, mm. and left, yeah, in Dallas, Texas, December first and second. It's a tribute to Richard Pryor. That I've been mm -hmm. uh, selected to do, so it's going to be an honor. Um, um, I just want, I want to get an Oscar for this movie, man, and that's where I'm aiming for. I don't want to. I think you're going to get it, man. I don't. I don't want to do it like, 
like just to do good. I want to go mm-hmm. beyond because if I get an Oscar, that means I did brilliant, awesome, mm-hmm. excellent. You know what I'm saying? So, like I said, man, I mean, I will always chase this movie. I will mm-hmm. always be active. I will always put it in the atmosphere. You know? Um, I live by like at the end of my shows, I always give my audience six pieces of words of wisdom. Mm. I said, um, and I end my show with, I know I made you all laugh, which is cool. But when I was nine years old, I told my mom what I wanted to be when I grew up. I told her I wanted to be a comedian. She told me, if you make people laugh, they'll love you. If they love you, they'll give you their attention. So why you got their attention, give them words of wisdom. Now, this wisdom I give them, I tell them and let them know that I did not make it up. It comes from my Heavenly Father. And if anybody can tell you they know what wisdom at and you're following them, you're following a fool. Um, only God has the wisdom that he shared with us. So mm-hmm. I give it to people. And the first piece is don't replace your attitude with anger. Just replace those who makes you angry. Mm-hmm. Second piece. Second piece is, if you want to be with the best, then be the best. That way the best will want to be with you. Third piece is, there are two types of people on this earth. Make sure you're neither and be unique. Um, My fourth piece is, a woman don't want a man she can't learn from. But a man, come on now. Yeah, a woman don't want a, a, a man don't want a woman that he can't teach. There we go. A man don't want a woman he can't teach. But a woman don't want a man she can't learn from. Um, the fifth piece is. Um, OK, there we go. Fifth piece. Is in order for you to get the house that you love, you got to first love the house you're in. And the last piece is a man without a plan is a mistake bound to happen. So, brothers and sisters, get your plan, bury it, water it, and watch your harvest success. And I can't think of a better way to, <laughs> to wrap mm-hmm. this up. That that was beautiful, man. Right on, brother. Right on. Right on, man. I really appreciate yeah. it, man. Slapstick video on uh, uh, no. Slapstick Comedy Magazine, man. Y'all are the <laughs> shit, but you smell better. <laughs> This is your boy Martini Harris, you know, along with Justin. What's up, bro, bro? Oh.